seven of you all for joining us on this special all live event on LinkedIn and YouTube. Let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. You all heard about Apple's new XR headset, the Vision Pro. It hasn't been released yet, and it's already making big waves in the XR industry. We have assembled today a star-studded panel with diverse views, including a VR skeptic. And in a moment, you'll meet some of the top analysts focused on Apple and XR to make sense of it and help you all, investors, entrepreneurs, developers, engineers, product folks, marketers, technologists, to prepare for what is poised to reshape the XR industry in 2024 and beyond. And there will be some predictions, so listen up closely. I encourage you all to post your thoughts and questions in the chat, and we'll try to address as much as we can. This should be fun. My name is Orin Barr. I am the founder of AWE and a 15-year veteran of the XR industry as an entrepreneur and investor, as you can see behind me. Um, the AR startup I founded in 2009 was acquired by Apple and probably had a dent in Apple's journey in XR. So I have some skin in this. Uh, but before we meet our panelists, I want to invite you all uh, to see the impact of Apple's new device on the XR industry in person at AWE Europe in Vienna coming up next month. Okay, are we ready to meet our star panelists? All right, first we have a special computing guru and one of the most quoted analysts about Apple, principal analyst at Moore's Insights and Strategies. Give it up for Anshul Sag. All right, we also have a major industry voice about the future of work and the heart of tech who tested firsthand the Apple Vision Pro. Put your virtual hands together for President and Principal Analyst at Creative Strategies, Carolina Milalesi. Hello, Carolina. Good morning, good afternoon, all. And please welcome one of the most experienced experts in the consumer technology market, who also tested the device firsthand, Lead Analyst and President at Techponential, Avi Greengard. Give it up for Avi. How's it going, Avi? Good. Thank you very much for having me. And to represent the voice of developers, give it up for Uber Gizmo co-founder, Hubert Nguyen. Hello, Hubert. Hello. Nice to be here. All right. Finally, we have a top executive behind one of the most advanced XR devices companies, which is brave enough to join us today. Give it up for Chief Brand Officer at Vario, UC McKinnon. Hi, UC. Hey, greetings from Helsinki, from Vario HQ, the home of the brave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, finalists, ready to spar. Uh, we have a lot to unpack in the next hour, so let's get started. And all you watching, again, please share your thoughts and questions in the chat. All right, let's start with the timing, the why now question. You know, the, the, uh, when, when an Apple announcement is, uh, is coming out, it's always a huge event in the tech industry as well as the world at large. They have great track record in timing the market perfectly. Now, for the last three years, we've all heard the rumors about an Apple headset being launched, but it didn't. And even this year, we heard rumors that there were some internal debates whether the new device is up for Apple's standards for a launch. Apple decided, of course, to go for it. And in my opinion, the main reason is that since 2007, global smartphone revenues have declined. So Apple probably had no choice. But here's the question to the panel. Before we get into the details about the product itself, let's start with the conclusion. Will Apple's Vision Pro yet again hit the perfect market timing with perfect product readiness? And I'm going to start with you, Carolina. What's your take? Wow, on the spot. Um, I do think that it will help the industry as a whole um, to drive forward and uh, help both on the consumer side and the enterprise side to see the opportunity around AR and VR. Um, 
I very much doubt is going to be um, an iPhone replacement for Apple, both in terms of users and revenue. I think that there are, and I'm sure we'll get into it as we discuss all of the topics that you outline, um, there are limitations as to uh, accessibility, both from a, a, an equity perspective and a, an actual accessibility perspective around VR and, a, and AR. Um, so it's not going to be as ubiquitous as a smartphone, but there's definitely opportunity there. I don't know that if I agree that they had no choice but bring it to market. Um, I think that what you're seeing right now on the Mac side offers Apple plenty of opportunity for growth, both in consumer and enterprise. Um, I do think that they're very well aware that it's going to take time to get to volumes that are worthwhile having is certainly not a hobby in the same way as maybe Apple TV has been for them for so many years. Um, and uh, I, you know, it's something that is going to grow, but I think there's a very tight relationship between where they want the Mac to be and where they think Vision Pro can be going forward. All right. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, Anshul, what's your take on the timing? Did they, will they hit this trifecta? Uh I think uh, Apple has the uh, unique position of uh, being a market maker where uh, they have the opportunity to create the timing themselves. Um, I, I also think that uh, iPhone is um, something that they've obviously been concerned about, um, especially with iPhone volumes starting to actually come down for the first time in a long time. And um, I think the one thing to consider is this is a long-term play, like Carolina had said. Um, this is not going to be something that uh, they can realize overnight. Um, and I, I think that really what, what's happening here is they had to launch something. Um, they had to put a product out there uh, and actually start iterating it and let developers start using it. Um, and I think that, you know, they've been wanting to launch this for a while um, and, you know, any kind of company that, that wants to launch a product and doesn't get it out to market in time uh, runs the risk of never launching it. And um, I think that's really the balance that they were trying to strike here is, do we launch something that maybe isn't perfect, um, but you know will help us iterate down the road, or do we keep iterating internally and, and, and you know taking the R&D costs uh, associated with it without actually re realizing any revenue or, or getting any developers to actually use it. So, um, you know, it's not very, very common for Apple to announce something almost a year in advance. Um, and this is going to be one of those things where um, I think they had to launch it and they, they need to get in developers' hands because ultimately this, in my opinion, is a developer device um, and they want to, to get developers uh, to actually start taking advantage of the ecosystem uh, and building apps towards uh, spatial computing. Awesome, thank you. Avi, is the product ready for the market and is the market ready for this product? Well, I mean, I think that the, the most interesting uh, part of that question is, you know, has Apple timed the market? Um, and uh, while I, I, I sort of disagree that the iPhone uh, declined volumes um, is the is the is the driver here? Um, I mean, they haven't released the car. Or they've been working on on that for years. It's just uh, either they don't believe that they have a differentiated product, or it's not ready, or the technology isn't ready. Um, and so uh, the the timing in terms of technology, clearly they have something that they feel that with the right displays and and the silicon uh, and the more silicon and the more silicon that's in this product, plus lots and lots of cameras and lots and lots of sensors that they can get a product out that does what they wanted to do. Um, but in terms of the overall uh, market timing, yeah, Apple tends to watch and wait for someone else to try something, see what, what didn't work, um, work on their own version behind closed doors for years. Um, and when they have something um, that they feel is differentiated, then they bring it to market. Uh, to solve specific problems rather than just to have something that uh, they can put out with buzzwords. Okay, that's a great start. Thank you for uh, starting us this morning. Uh, we're going to 
move to the next question, which is really almost an enigma, a first, I think, of its kind, the fact that we, we've seen a VR headset being launched without mentioning the word VR. And, you know, if you look at Tim Cook's uh, history, he's been expressing his enthusiasm for AR since 2016, when he predicted that everyone will use it regularly, like eating three meals a day. <laughs> and, you know, Apple acquired a bunch of AR startups, uh, released a bunch of uh, AR products on the, the smartphone, and uh, really have been building an army of AR developers. And, you know, during the peak metaverse hype, Apple's SVP uh, of marketing, Jaws, said about the metaverse that it's a word they will never use. So Apple really wanted to build an AR headset, but it seems like, you know, the tech wasn't there. So uh, they came up with, uh, with this device. And I want to kind of hear a bit more from you about some of their choices there. Uh, do you think they went for kind of a more positioning it as a special computer and an AR device um, because of the ideals, as in to avoid human isolation? Or is it more of a defiant positioning against some of the incumbent VR players? Let's start with uh, Angel. What, what's your take? I, I think that um, I think there are some technological limitations uh, on the AR side. Uh, I believe that when you look at what's happening in the VR market. Obviously, Apple doesn't want to be associated with that. Um, but I think technologically, they are forced to uh, build an, uh, a mixed reality device that uh, enables them and their developers to build AR apps uh, and to enable AR experiences that are, are good uh, and that consumers enjoy. Uh, and if that has to happen on a VR headset with AR pass through, um, I think that's effectively what, what has to happen, which is what happened with the Vision Pro effectively. Um, and I think that they would love to have launched an AR device first, um, but I just think the realities of physics and uh, economies of scale in the industry today uh, don't allow for AR glasses to really be something that um, a consumer can enjoy um, at least today. I think in the future, that's absolutely a possibility. Um, there's a lot of AR headsets out there that do have a lot of capabilities, but they're fairly limited. And a lot of those are enterprise focused. And I think uh, that's the challenge that we see is that, you know, this is ultimately going to be a consumer play down the road. Uh, and it has to uh, be good enough for consumers to enjoy. And I think that's why you're seeing, you know, this pass through experience, especially at the high resolution, because um, you know, the laws of physics with AR um, make it more and more challenging to do high resolution, high quality experiences. Thank you, Angel. Carolina, you uh, actually, uh, I think as a self-proclaimed VR skeptic and has also tried the, uh, the device firsthand. So what do you think of kind of about this uh, VR versus AR question around the, VR, the Vision Pro? Well, I agree with Anshul as far as the, the technical limita limitation that the market is facing right now from a, a, an AR perspective. But I also think that it's smart to play both, right, from a market opportunity, especially at the beginning when um, at the end of the day, we still don't know uh, how big the VR or AR market is going gonna, is gonna to be. Considering the cost of the device, I always think that is a hard... Um, is a hard game to play to convince somebody to spend $3,000 on something that will be limited in the amount of time and location that you can spend on it, right? So I think that having the opportunity to um, experience a more open environment and decide and be in control of how immersive you want to be is a smart move. Um, as a... Uh, um, you know, as somebody who has done VR and started out with joining a room and physically as an avatar go in a corner because that's where I felt safe because in the real world I was shut down. Having the ability to see somebody approach me while I am immersed was game changer for me. Um, and I don't know if it's because I'm a woman or if it's because I 
don't like uh, I'm a control freak and I don't like <laughs> feeling isolated I, you know there's there's so much that is societal and personal in these kind of experiences um, that I, I believe Apple is giving the opportunity to people to choose their level of comfort and by doing so open up the opportunity to a larger market than not so early in the game, decide which one it is that is going to win. Awesome. Uh, Avi, uh, do, do you think that the opportunities with an AR headset are limited just in terms of the amount of time you could use it during the day? Well, I mean, in this particular headset um, is not the lightest thing I've ever had on my head. Um, and uh, while the demos that we got were between 30 and 45 minutes, I didn't time it exactly. Um, and there was no eye strain at all. And I usually do get motion sickness um, from especially pass through. And I did not in this particular case. I could still uh, easily see um, that long sessions could give people above the age, around my age, well, let's just leave it at that, uh, 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 eye strain. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are going to be limitations to the first generation, how long you're able to to, to wear it um, and what types of sessions you're going to want to do. But, you know, technology moves on. I, I'm, I'm not worried long term um, that you won't be able to use this over long periods of time. Um, and we'll see how the form factor evolves um, and when we can get AR type use cases um, that maybe you will wear for, for more periods of the day in more locations, but Apple needed to get something out there. And this is more capable than anything else I've ever seen. Awesome. Hubert, you uh, are coming from the developer's perspective, open source world. How, what, what's kind of the impression you heard from, from your, uh, about, about this device in terms of, you know, AR versus VR? What's your take? Look, I, I think, um... Uh, the people who are the most excited are the the ones who are not working in building uh, XR and VR content. Um, I I think a lot of people are excited by the the prospect of having like a, a leading edge uh, headset in terms of technology and the prospect of having a mass market consumer down the road. The most exciting part I think for developers is to be able to. When you have a new piece of hardware that's more advanced, it basically saves you time. You can work like one year ahead in the future and get ready for when the actual product uh, hits the, the, the consumer market. Uh, in terms of timing, I think what Apple is trying to do is they need to position themselves. It's going to take decades to find a use case that most people want to use. And for example, macOS is not a great gaming platform. Apple doesn't want to be in that position ever again. Apple wants to have the developer mind share. They want them to work on Apple devices now and build for Apple and then maybe port it on the different platform down the road. So leading, uh, that's how you get some footprint. All right, fantastic. All right, let's move on to the next uh, big question, which is who is this device really for? Uh, you know, people in the XR industry, I think for the most part, didn't get scared by the price tag of $3,500. Because I think we all understand it's most, it's probably the most sophisticated device of its kind. You know, with the 12 cameras, five sensors, highest resolution display, or almost <coughs> highest display, I should say, you see. Uh, plus an external uh, display and, you know, building of material is really super expensive. And uh, above all, I think we understand it's not meant initially for consumers. So, um, folks, what's, what's kind of your take on, on who is this for? Uh, is it developers? Is it enterprises? What is Apple expecting to do this? And also kind of, you know, most of the demos in the announcement were actually uh, geared for kind of everyday things, you know, just watching TV, working on a laptop, so like almost like everyday type of uh, experiences, not kind of trying to push the envelope with advanced uh, spatial computing capabilities. 
So how, how do you kind of read this and how do you explain this dichotomy between maybe one of the most advanced devices in spatial computing and on the other hand, very almost mundane use cases? Who wants to start? I can start, for example. Go so, ahead, you see. Uh, so just to start with that, with a short story, I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was an augmented world expo, like usually, but I had the longest shoes there and there were a couple of Apple people there, like usually, looking through our headset and, you know, wondering, you know, pass through and all that. So I do believe that, you know, those kind of experiences finally kind of gave them that, hey, you know, the technology is getting ready uh, for for a kind of larger use. And and Vario from the very beginning, we've been focusing on the industrial or the most advanced users, you know, for the jet fighter pilots, the astronauts, the car designers and all that, because there the demands are the highest and you need the highest quality there. And uh, from the very beginning, we've been kind of making that kind of market uh, statement very clear that we are there. Now, if I look at the uh, Apple, their marketing, um, their, the way that they present their devices and, and, and the Apple Vision Pro, which, which is absolutely fantastic, you know, you can clearly see that where they're heading is the consumer market. Like that's, that's the thing that where they want to be, but want, where they want to ultimately be. Obviously, the device is expensive now, but it's aimed for the developers. It's aimed for the developers who are making, making that kind of content. And obviously, they want to make it as high end as possible to see those possibilities in that, in that kind of future market. But I do believe that, you know, uh, taking into account the way that they position the device, uh, you know, their whole kind of market strategy with their kind of content and, and, and their ecosystem. And at the same time, the kind of the lack of uh, industrial or enter enterprise ready uh, kind of things that they're showing. I, I, I do kind of feel that it is, it is the consumer market where they're going. Okay, Anshul, what's uh, oh, Carolina? You no, you're Anshul was before me, so <laughs> okay, I'll wait. Anshul, so you... I'm going to disagree with you, so I can wait. <laughs> Anshul, so who is who is it for? How how do you see kind of the first couple of years uh, playing out? I mean, I think it's quite. Most of us will agree. First and foremost, it's for developers. Um, I think there's also a very clear. Um, messaging towards enterprises. Um, I think that enterprises may be not ready for it yet, um, but I think they want enterprises to uh, approach the device as a development platform for their applications um, and to uh, maybe not go straight to productization right off the bat, um, but kind of test it in in house um, and ensure that it fits their their needs. Um, and build apps towards it. Um, so that's, I think, that the two primary audiences that they're targeting right now. Uh, down the road, I think it's also very much a prosumer product um, for the Apple enthusiast, as well as the Apple user who wants the best of the best experience. Um, that will be someone who already has heavily invested in Apple's ecosystem and is willing to deal with maybe some of the early bugs and, and challenges of using a new platform. And then on top of that, I think um, they actually want this to be a showcase device for stores um, so that when people first try, you know, Apple's version of XR, uh, that it is the best possible version in existence and that the experiences that they try will be the best possible experiences that exist in the market, um, whether that's for Apple or others. Um, simply because they have the highest resolution, they have all the cameras, and they're able to get developers to build applications towards this maximum possible experience. Um, and I think that's kind of the top level of, of who and why uh, you know, this device is for. Thanks, Carolina. You, you uh, talk a lot about the future of work. What's, what's the place you see for Vision Pro in that future? Well, f first of all, I, I wanted to go back to the consumer versus enterprise uh, point. I, I thought it was remarkable that Apple actually started talking about Vision Pro from an enterprise perspective and a collaboration perspective. They don't do that um, often at all. Probably, uh, you know, I can count on less than one hand and the, the time is that they started that way, um, which is why I, I was saying I was going to disagree with, with you. So yes, from a market perspective, um, it will get to consumers. And I think that entertainment is a big play for Vision Pro, uh, given what Apple is doing in the uh, 
entertainment business, be music or uh, or TV, and especially with sports, it was interesting that some of the demos that we had were around exactly that. It was, you know, being in a, in a uh, kind of a personal concert with Alicia Keys versus being behind the goal or the base or the um, uh, basketball at a game, right? Uh, so I think there's a big consumer play, but they started with enterprise. And I do think that they want to have spatial computing and own that space going forward versus letting Microsoft own that from an enterprise perspective. Whether or not they're going to be successful, time will tell. But they definitely want to play a bigger role in defining computing in an enterprise context than they did in the past. Fantastic. Um you know, there's also this question about how they they position it, you know, as a spatial computer. And Avi, I know you've uh, kind of written about that aspect. Do you see this term really uh, sticking with with people, uh, you know, developers or maybe consumers later on? Apple tends to do a very good job of positioning its products. And uh, sometimes it brands things that don't need to be branded. But in this particular case, um, this this really is something where is it ar is it vr is it xr is it mr apple says forget about all that this is spatial computing and spatial computing is a way of looking at the problems that they're trying to solve in that it's it's computing so we're doing the same things we might do on a mac or on a or on an iphone but we're doing it in three dimensional space and there might be you might be completely immersed. You might not be immersed. Um, and by by specifically calling it out as spatial computing, um, they're really opening up uh, the possibilities of, of the types of uh, of applications that they see going forward. They're not they're not pigeonholing it as a metaverse, as a place where you go and and change who you are. No, you can use this just as a giant monitor or as a home theater. Um, a, a personal virtual home theater, um, and and I think that also goes back to the the question you were asking earlier, which is who's this for? Um, and I would agree that the initial version is for anyone who's willing to spend thirty five hundred dollars and up. I'm sure by the time you're done configuring this, it's going to be uh, more <laughs> more than that, probably yeah. closer to four or five thousand. But uh, anyone who's willing to, to pay for that, whether you're an, a, a computing enthusiast, a technology enthusiast, an enterprise developer, um, um, a gaming developer, um, yes, uh, Apple is, wants you to buy this, but especially um, the developers. And that's why I was introduced at WWDC. This was an introduction. Yes, they showed off a lot of consumer use cases, but this was an introduction uh, of a platform. And when you have a platform, you need people to come up with something to do on that platform. And Apple threw out a few ideas. Um, whether those are necessarily the best ideas, is that how we're actually going to be using this five years from now? Probably not. I would say some of them will stick and some of them won't. Um, but the but that's the whole goal is to get people writing apps for this platform and then seeing what is the most compelling. Cool. So quick question to the whole panel. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you think the term spatial computing will stick as the main way to describe XR and all these different uh, acronyms? Hubert, you're not raising your hand. Well, what's kind of your take? Where do you, where do you think you see this is going? Look, the, uh, in terms of communications, people will follow where you put your communications money. Uh, as for developers, they don't care about the positioning. Uh, it's not because you call it something different that is going to change uh, any developer's life. Um, I think we, we can look at the problem in, in three ways. One is the display quality. So uh, XR, it's an immersive display technology. So in that sense, this is limited by physics and hardware. Right? So what you perceive is going to be defined by how good your hardware is. And of course, the software and, and all that. But the, the, tech, the 3D technology behind that is not all that different from what we use in video games, for example. Secondly, you have the apps and use cases. And we're still kind of poking around. So for example, if you talk about replaying like 3D movies and things like that, that's more of a content 
issue, content uh, uh, production and generation. That's super expensive too, but we know how to do that. Uh, but not a lot of people have a burning desire to have a headset, uh, even to watch TV. So we're still looking through what people want to do, how this could be useful to uh, most people. And that's why most of the XR business is in B2B right now. Awesome. You see, you also didn't raise your hand. What, what's the term you think people will use? Yeah, I, I'm with Hubert on this one. So obviously now Apple is using it. And before, before Apple, um, Magic Leap was using spatial computing as well. So, you know, nothing wrong with the term. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's a little bit kind of like irrelevant, you know, mobile computing, spatial computing. It's, it's, it's logical to call it spatial computing. But, you know, will it kind of stick and be, you know, widely used? For now, maybe maybe a bit, but I, I think these terms will change, and 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 you know probably better terms even even will come up, and ultimately it's the developers who are using, using that and creating those experiences will be kind of like defining defining that right kind of bracket for that one through the experiences they are creating, um, but uh, but yeah, nothing wrong with the uh, the uh, the terms. So, you know, all cool. so so it looks like the panel is in agreement that initially it's obviously for developers. What, what do you think will take for this product to really reach the consumer market? We, we heard some rumors that it may come in 2025. Uh, you know, what, what, are, what are some of the features that they may uh, be able to drop from this initial very kind of air centric vision? And what's the price point that we'll need in order to hit the consumer market? Who wants to take it? Carolina, ready? Sure. Um so from a use case perspective, I think it's going to have to be something that gives high return of investment in a short amount of time. Um, I think that, um, you know, Abby was talking about earlier about weight and, and we were talking about limitations of obviously the things and where you can be with something stuck on your face. Um, so having something that I can use for I don't know, an hour a day, maybe two hours a day throughout the day, but that delivers high value to me is going to be critical so that I don't think about, okay, I use this X amount of times or is really the value that is very visceral to me that is being given. Um, that is going to be different from different people, right? So you can have entertainment is definitely an easy way to do it. Having that idea of, uh, having best seat in the house, no matter where you are, I think is is a good one. Um, I do see potential in education, similar to what we're seeing with iPad. Uh, obviously, the price points will have to be way more affordable than that. Um, but I do think uh, there's there's opportunity there and an enterprise for sure. I, I think generally from a VR perspective, back to the point that Huber was making, we see the adoption coming from an enterprise first versus consumer because of the prices, because the return of investment that you're putting on a $2,000, $3,000 device is going to be more obvious in enterprise than it is for a consumer. Uh, but that will help with, with volume and bringing the prices down. Uh, where I see a price point that consumer will will be able to to stomach or be willing to invest, depending where you sit, um, probably about 15, 1800. Um, we have to remember as well that Apple is building up opportunity to pay in installments and have all other sorts of ways to make that price more digestible uh, for a lot of consumers. And I think that is not going to end. It's not going to be quite like the smartphone where, you know, you don't feel the price of the iPhone in most countries that have subsidies. Um, but there are going to be other ways that I'm sure Apple is going to be willing to incentivize um, to make that, that product more accessible to more people. Right. Angel, what, what, what's it going to take for this compu computer, I uh, was going to say, special computer to reach the consumer market? Well, I, I agree with Carolina on price. Uh, you know, it does have to come down considerably. Um, I think to slightly address the earlier question and, and the question you just asked, I think a lot of the apps you're seeing today are, are low hanging fruit. Um, these are apps that we've seen on other platforms that have been semi-successful. Um, so I think Apple's going after the low-hanging fruit first. Um, and some of these things will be successful because they've already been successful. Um, but I think, in my opinion, 
for consumers to really take up these platforms, we actually need to see a differentiated experience from what's available on the smartphone today. And not only does it have to be differentiated, it actually needs to be better, right? Because why would someone go and spend, you know, over a thousand dollars on a platform that doesn't do anything better than what they already have today? So it needs to do what they have. It needs to do better than what they have today. And it needs to do it in a way that's seamless. Um, and that it, it does it with the apps that they already use today. <clears throat> and then the new applications that take advantage of spatial computing. And that's why I think um, it's so important for Apple to come to market with the Vision Pro and make sure that developers embrace the platform in a meaningful manner. Because in my opinion, and this is something of opinion I've had since 2016, that in order for XR to displace the smartphone market in any meaningful way, um, it needs to deliver the same types of apps at an equal or better experience level than what's available on the smartphone. Now, I don't necessarily fully believe that the XR space will replace the smartphone. Um, that was an antiquated view that I had. Um, I think today, anyone who understands computing platforms and looks at the past, you'll see that the new platform does not necessarily displace the old one. Um, it simply augments and adds new capabilities. Um, obviously, there is some market replacement in terms of TAM. Um, but overall, you know, the, the, they kind of exist in harmony. Uh, if you look at Apple, you know, they have this, they have the iPhone, they have the Mac. Um, they didn't abandon the Mac for the iPhone. So uh, I think this is going to be one of those things where uh, Vision Pro and all of its spatial computing software will take advantage of what's in place today, but also needs to deliver a, a noticeably better experience with new apps and old apps that functions just as good, if not better than the previous platform. Otherwise, I just don't see why people would go out of their way to spend an additional amount of money uh, to use this platform, especially when you look at like, you know, the Vision Pro right now, there's a lot of tie-in with the Mac. And I think that's because they want to show uh, an experience where you can augment your existing workflow and improve it with Vision Pro, which is something that if you look at a lot of the enterprise apps today for XR, the most successful ones are the ones that don't break your workflow, but actually, you know, fit into your workflow and augment it and make it better. So the main path to the consumer market is content. It's always been the case, uh, but in order to reduce the price, they'll have to drop some of the features. I mean, of course, the scale will help. And the one thing that, you know, no other VR headset has ever had is this, the, uh, the ability to see your eyes through the visor. Uh, is that something they think they'll drop for the consumer market? And if so, does it really lose a lot of the AR aspect of this device? I think that purely exists because this is a VR headset with pass-through. If they're able to build an AR headset with see-through optics, they don't need this, right? This was, in my opinion, this was a compromise that, that internal teams at Apple's made to say, this is still an AR device because we have, we can see your eyes. Do we um, all agree on this in the panel? I, I, I do kind of agree. I mean, like it's such a, you know, interesting design decision to have those, you know, eyes that no one has yet seen, like how they actually work uh, on top of that, you know, um, and uh, in order to make it social, and one of the things that, you know, takes for technology become truly kind of consumer friendly and oriented and all that, you know, is, is it needs to be social. And one way to tackle that um, becoming a little bit more social um, is to, you know, basically create eyes. So it doesn't, so that somebody who doesn't have the headset can kind of interact with you in a, in a, in a more um, natural way. So it's, um, it is, it is a, it is a used for that reason, but, you know, is it a must uh, for you know the vision air coming sometime for the future? I don't think. So. Uber, you were gonna respond. Look, I think the the decision of uh, having a pass through camera was a practical one. Uh, if you need to have the maximum footprint and and development capabilities, uh, VR can do both. And yes, you have trade offs in terms of how good the uh, AR is. Because if you think about it, 
Uh, if you have a real AR uh, headset, the reality is like 100% correct. But once you have a pass-through, now you're degrading reality, and then you're augmenting it a little bit with uh, 3D on top of it. Uh, but I think it's an acceptable trade-off, um, uh, given today's environment for Apple, uh, and they made the right decision on that one, uh, from my point of view. Have you any different opinion on this? Uh, a little bit. Um, I just want to take a slightly contrarian view on pricing and and whether it needs to come down um, in order to uh, attack the consumer market. Um, it depends how large a consumer market you uh, are, are talking about. There's no question that there are large swaths of the population who simply can't afford something that costs 3500 But then there's the part of the market that can. And if you can create um, experiences that are worth $3,500, people will pay $3,500 to get those experiences. We've seen that with every technology that's come out. The original IBM PC um, in today's dollars is like six or $8,000. Um, the uh, When plasma televisions came out, they started out at $10,000, and they hovered between five dollars and $8,000 for years, but they gave you a TV that sat flat against your wall, and that was awesome, and so people bought them. So, you know, the average car nowadays costs way too much money. But uh, my point is only that, um, yes, um, Apple will be able to sell a lot more. If we can get down to, well, Caroline, I believe, said 1500 to 1800 um, But at the same time, I think there's likely a larger market than you'd think if uh, those experiences are exciting um, and uh, and compelling and something you want to return to. I mean, Samsung has a gaming monitor that costs $3,500. It's huge. It's awesome. Um, do they sell millions upon millions of them? No, but they do sell because, again, it gives you something unique. Um, Apple's own um, Mac line goes way above $3,500, depending on how you configure them. And people are buying those in the millions. So uh, I, I, I don't think price per se, value, yes, but price doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the only arbiter of how this gets to the consumer market. And I also think that the, the, the flip side of that is the enterprise market has been waiting for something with APIs that they can develop to that has mass market availability on the hardware side. Um, basically, everything that Microsoft promised for HoloLens just never happened. Um, and if you're selling anything that you could replace a truck roll with a headset in the box or software because you know that they're going to buy the headset on their own, um, you know, that's a win. There are a lot, a lot of enterprise opportunities uh, here. And um, and as you see, can attest, um, you know, the uh, thirty-five hundred dollar price point is is low um, in that market. I, awesome. If I can add to what Avi is saying for a second, two points. One, I think that consumer market, as we were talking, was meant as mass market versus just consumer versus enterprise. And sure. why the comment about lower pricing? I, I see a comment about Taylor Swift in the in the chat which is uh spot on like if you are able to create a visceral connection to this thing and not sell it as a piece of hardware absolutely there's no question that people are going to spend more money linked to it and i think a good example that pertains to apple is the apple watch ultra like that is positioned as something for people that are really into fitness and yet people that are not even working out are buying it. Why? Because stylistically is a, is a great looking device and because the battery life lasts way longer than a regular Apple Watch battery life, right? So you find those little things that are going to broaden your addressable market. And as I said at the beginning, I think that visceral connection with, with content is definitely going to be one. Yeah. All right, fantastic. I, Folks, we're now switching to uh, maybe the heart of the discussion today, which is what will be the impact on the XR market? And we know we're already seeing since the, even the rumors started to get louder that Samsung, Google, Qualcomm already kind of preparing some 
uh, return of the Android-like alliance. We see Meta announcing the Quest 3 and just uh, last week the Quest Pro with uh, LG kind of being rumored or an semi-announced. So do you guys see the, uh, this, the market uh, uh, for spatial computing, for XR, repeating what we've seen with smartphones, you know, the Android versus iOS market? And uh, what does it do to all the existing, you know, 50 plus XR glasses manufacturers out there? Uh, and I'll start with you, Yussi. You, you uh, need to respond to what's happening in the market. How are you addressing it? Absolutely. Um, so the thing with, especially enterprise, um, especially industrial market, is that you do need a lot of computing power. Uh, if you're thinking about flight simulators or, or you know, car designer running V-Red and wanting to have a photorealistic replica of your car and seeing all those stitches. You need a lot of computing power and, you know, mobile phone chips, mobile chips, you know, are very limited in them. And there's a reason why we, you know, use NVIDIA chip we use 49 to see a kind of like photorealistic version full size of your car. So um, a lot of these kind of industrial and especially the more advanced use cases you go, you just you know need that power locally or from the cloud, and and there's no way uh, around that. And and you know that together with the with the software compatibility and 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 the workflows that are using uh, that people are using in the enterprise sector do kind of define also like you know what kind of what kind of products, what kind of ecosystem you know fit in a different different verticals. And um, and in that way, there will be always need for for you know those cases that are kind of kind of mission critical in a way that you know that just you know need the highest amount of GPU power uh, possible, and and that's basically exactly the place where Vario is. So Vario is not afraid. Sorry, um, are we afraid? No, no. I mean, like we were super happy that Apple came with the product. That was you know excellent product, and you know. Obviously, you know, people are getting excited. It's validating the market. It's great for us using basically similar technology as we have on a pass-through. But ultimately, uh, you know, if we think of the sheer kind of GPU power and, and, and computing power and, and the things that you can do with the headset and things you can see with the headset, there's a huge difference uh, in, you know, using using uh, a 4090 versus uh you know, uh, mobile phone chip on your, on your, on your, on your, on your pet. Awesome. And Shell, do we see the iOS versus Android uh, market split uh, ret returning with sm spatial computing? Um, I'm going to be very harsh here. Um, Please do. <laughs> I don't think so. And I think the reason why is because, not because of Apple, it's because of Google. Um, I think if you're going to see the split, um, it'll most likely be between Meta and Apple. Um, I just don't have any confidence in Google's ability to deliver in the XR space. Um, as you've been around long enough, you've seen them try and fail multiple times, um, and they've burned too many bridges, and I think they're going to have a very hard time coming back into the market, um, even though I believe they are going to try. Um, their lack of execution um, and their just reputation in the market has doomed them, in my opinion. Um, and they will have to spend more money and time and resources than I think they're willing to spend to change people's opinions of them. So um, I don't think we're going to have an Android, iOS, Apple split. I think it's going to be a meta Apple split. And I think we've already seen that, that war happening um, between Apple and meta with Apple uh, attempting to destroy Meta's revenue streams on the mobile side. Um, and I think you're going to see those back and forth continue to occur. Um, I actually think we also have some players in the space as well that might not fit into this narrative uh, very smoothly. Um, but, you know, so Sony is a player as well. Um, they, they do have a headset. They have a compute platform. So um, they are somebody, somebody to consider as well. Uh, Prior to Apple's entry in the market in the VR space, it was very much meta Sony back and forth. So I think Sony is going to still be part of this conversation. And I do think Google will try to re-enter the, 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 the conversation with Samsung. Um, but we'll see whether or not that will actually come to fruition because 
they actually already had a very good pair of AR glasses in North that they acquired uh, going on three years ago. And that product was probably one of the best AR products in existence. Uh, and I got a chance to try their second generation product, which fixed most of the problems of the first generation product. And that product has yet to come to market. So um, I think the Google conversation uh, is, is a challenging one because Google has failed to um, actually get these products to uh, fruition and continue to live. They keep canceling things. Um, so people just don't really um, think that they're going to have much staying power. And, you know, they, they just keep killing things. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work well for a market like this where you have to have staying power. Yeah, but I have to say, you know, Google is predominantly a software company like Microsoft, you know, and they've done amazing things with Google uh, Maps Live View, which is just incredibly working everywhere around the world. So, Avi, I mean, you've written quite a bit about kind of uh, that fact that, you know, uh, I think Microsoft as well is, is sort of abandoning HoloLens or the hardware side, really focusing on their strength, which is software. How, how do you see kind of this market evolving? Well, I mean, from the software side, I think actually Microsoft, ironically, is going to be one of the big winners here because they are partnering with Apple. Um, you know, their apps will run inside the Apple Vision Pro. But I think also on the enterprise side, um, you know, Microsoft has shifted to cloud and dynamics. And um, even when they had their own headset, well, they still technically do. <clears throat> but even when they were <coughs> actively investing in HoloLens, they set they separated out the apis so that you could when if you were writing um you weren't writing directly to the hololens hardware and so uh, i do think that microsoft as a middleware player for the enterprise is actually um uh, going to come off pretty well here um i also think that um you know meta is is going to have an interesting choice ahead of it um does it try to um, double down on the low end, um, the more accessible price for, uh, consumer products, um, the, the, the Quest 3, the Quest 4, et, uh, et cetera, or do they try to take on Apple directly at the high end? Um, and uh, I, I think you know, it, taking on Apple directly um, is going to be really hard. Um, you've got a tremendous amount of technology um, in that headset. And Apple can get the developer community to rally around it in a way that maybe Meta can't. Uh, Meta certainly hasn't proven uh, its ability to do so to date uh, outside of exercise and uh, entertainment gaming. Uh, again, mostly targeting their lower end products, which have mass market adoption. So. Um, I, I, we will definitely see Google and Samsung and Qualcomm um, a joint effort to build sort of an open ecosystem. Um, we'll see where where on the capabilities front that that and and pricing front that effort lands. Um, but um, it may be easier to attack Apple where Apple isn't, which is from the bottom um, or even from those um, AR glasses. Um, uh, things like, uh, I love Anshul's example of North, but things like more limited, if you can show me a use case where it actually works and I can actually wear it all the time and it doesn't do that much, but the things it does are worth paying for. Um, yeah, a Apple isn't doing that. Apple's building an entire computing platform at the high end and they'll eventually bring it down in price. Um, if you can start low and, and build up, I think um, you're, you're more likely to succeed long-term uh, from a competitive perspective. All right, Carolina, uh, who do you think, what sectors or players stand to gain the most from the, the Vision Pro release? What well, sectors? Um... I think it's early days. I mean, we we talked about the limitations of the um, of the price point, but um, we also mentioned education as being one that can take advantage of spatial computing going forward if actually schools are willing to invest in their children as they should. Um, and I get off my soapbox for a second. Um, but um, I think there's definitely opportunity there. There's opportunity in training. There's opportunity in entertainment. Uh, there is opportunity in retail. 
there's a lot there that um, that we can think of. I thought it was interesting. You know, we commented earlier about how the use cases that we saw from Apple were pretty basic, and you know, there was nothing different than what we've seen before. And I think that that to some extent was necessary because it's too early still in the market to get people to think differently. You know, educating people at this point to something that is very different from what they're seeing so far would have added more complexity to their, you know, their coming out party, so to speak. So I think that that showing people what you can do and just say basically that you can do it better because of the optics and because of, you know, the screen, because of pass through all the experiences that Apple has added to Vision Pro, I think was the easiest way to do it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, folks, we have just a few minutes left, so I want to hear quick answers from you on some predictions. And we'll start with each one of you kind of around the panel. Uh, what, what is the most, uh, the, the capability that you're most excited about with Vision Pro that you think will be mostly used and, and kind of change things, change how we, we live? So let's start with who's ready to start? Angela, go ahead. Um, I actually think the ability to kind of record your life um, will be very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure that it will be something that will take, to your point, take very, very quickly um, or be mass market. But I think it's a unique capability um, that I think will allow people to uh, record their life in a very interesting manner and be able to play it back. Um, the challenge is obviously that you have to be wearing a headset for it to happen. Um, so you're not fully in, in, in that environment or in that experience when you're doing that recording. Or maybe use your iPhone to record it and view it on Vision Potentially, Pro. yes. But I don't think the iPhone has the, the, the camera array that the headset does. Um, I think ultimately uh, the experiences are going to be spatial. Um, they don't exist yet. Um, it's kind of like asking us what, you know, what smartphone apps today will have existed five years ago. Um, so I think we don't really know but they're going to be spatial. Um, okay. And I think they're going to be AI and accelerated and, and use AI in a lot of ways that uh, we don't fully understand yet. So I think it's going to be a very strong uh, combination of AI and spatial computing. Um, and honestly, I, if I knew what it was, I would, would probably have started my own company. Right. Uber, <laughs> quick, quick answer. Uh, what's the capability of the Vision Pro you're most excited about? Look, I think that for recording our life, uh, glasses would be more convenient. Uh, but uh, I was pretty excited by the, by the design and by the efforts that Apple has put into making the, the GUI better. I think uh, the experience of a lot of VR headsets is a little bit lacking, especially for our consumers. But I'm most interested by uh, seeing and knowing what the, fuzz, <laughs> the field of view is and what's the maximum uh, pixel density is at the focus point, and the fact that uh, there's not a lot of information out there makes me a little bit pessimistic. And so I think the um, we need a, a higher quality, a higher display quality, uh, and and that's the the thing that I'm looking forward to. Carolina, what you're most excited about? Yeah. Uh, from the current product, I love the fact that I didn't have to set it up. Um, you know, other than than uh, um, taking into account my vision, and I happen to be short-sighted, so that took two seconds. Uh, but I didn't have to set up my perimeter to operate. I didn't have to learn how to use the control. So that simplicity lowers the barrier of entry. And uh, um, what I'm most excited, or, or you know, if I think about a call out to anyone, not just Apple is to be inclusive, not just from a price point perspective, but really from a human perspective, to not think about, as we often do in tech, about the few versus the many. Avi? Yeah, so um, two things. Uh, one, oh, um, and Carolina just mentioned this, the user interface, they, they simply nailed it. Um, it is. It took me, I think, three seconds to learn. I never had any issues with it. Um, the one or two times where I missed a touch point uh, or a tap point or whatever, it was obvious that I had missed it. And so uh, even even when it didn't work, it worked. Um, so um, and you could see why it didn't work. 
it, just beautifully designed. It makes using the thing so much better. And then the other was just um, how much I want to use this product from the perspective of I don't feel isolated when I do. Um, usually when you put on a VR headset, you're afraid you're going to stumble over your couch, your cat, you're going to bang into something. Any if Someone could walk into you. In, in, in the Apple Vision Pro, um, they've made it so that the pass-through is so good that even and and people sort of fade into view if they get close to you, like there's sort of a ghost coming um, through the mist, and that just makes it a more welcoming experience. I'm less, I, I'm less afraid that if I put this on, I can't know what's going on in my space. I can't, um, I, I'm, I'm isolated. Um, so I don't know what the apps are going to be. Um, I, I think that the initial ones a lot you're going to, you know, you'll be able to use all sorts of iOS apps. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily compelling enough. Um, um, but when someone creates an app specifically for this that takes full advantage uh, of both uh, the virtual and the and the real, because it can do that, um, and I can walk around my room, which it can do that. Um, some, I saw in the comments somebody asking, it's, you, you, do you need to be seated? Do you need to be stationary? No. But when I have those experiences, and I'm willing to do that because I know that when I put it on, um, I'm not isolated. That's that's exciting. You see, what what are you most excited about? Yeah, I mean, like in terms of technology, um, nothing that revolutionary. I mean, like we've been we've been working with that kind of technologies from from water for for several years. But I totally agree with Carolina and and Avi that you know if there's something that Apple is a master and they nail and they polish to the end, it is the user experience. So awesome. I'm most excited to actually, you know, use that and try that and, and they will set the new barrier uh, in that field for sure. Uh, so I, I think that is the, uh, that is the most, you know, interesting and the, and, and what kind of drives that in my mind is definitely the kind of like the strive towards the kind of like the, uh, wider adoption, call it the prosumer or, or, or consumer market. But, you know, ultimately, if I think about the way that they position and tell the story about the product and they find their marketing message, you know, that's that's the vision that they are kind of like setting for that. And you cannot go there unless the user experience is exactly like Carolina and Abby, Abby said. So, you know, can't wait to can't 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 wait to test it out. And, and hopefully, you know, this will drive the, the consumer market in the, in the, in the future. Thank you, everybody. Uh, folks, this is all the time we have for today. I would love to have been able to continue this conversation. You guys are so awesome. And I want to thank you for joining us today, especially early morning on the West Coast. And hope it helped everybody on this uh, session to uh, prepare for the upcoming Big Bang in XR. So big applause for our panelists. And folks, if you want to hear or see more of Apple's impact on the XR industry, even before it's launched, and you want to see it in person, please join us at AWE EU in Vienna next month. You can sign up on our website, awexr.com, and make sure to take advantage of the early bird rate, which expires on Tuesday. So uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, let's keep the conversation going in the chat. And panelists, if you want to share some contact information, or some uh, links, uh, please do uh, following up the session. Once again, thank you all and have a fantastic year.